This program is proudly brought to you by Intuit, powering prosperity around the world. Canada is known around the world for many things, cold weather, hockey and poutine to name a few. But one thing that has flown under the radar, artificial intelligence. Toronto and Montreal have emerged as epicenters for AI and machine learning. Heavyweights like Samsung, Google and Uber have set up shop in the Great White North to capitalize on the expertise. And academics have been cozying up to Silicon Valley for years. But there are fears the success is waning. In 2019, only one Canadian AI company made a list of the top 100 in the world. And more research shows the majority of promising AI startups are based in the US. Hello and welcome. On this episode of the AI Edge, we're going to explore how Canada has been so successful in developing world-class AI companies and talent, and what the country needs to do to keep its pole position. To start things off, I'm joined by executives from Canada's National AI Institutes. Garth Gibson is CEO and President of the Vector Institute. Cam Linky is CEO of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, known as AMI. And Stéphane Letourneau is Executive Vice President at Mila. Garth, let's start with you. How and why did Canada become a global leader in artificial intelligence and machine learning? Well, to start with, the uh, government and the universities invested in long-range exploratory technology starting 30 years ago. That technology uh, led to superstars choosing to be in big Canadian universities, places like the University of Alberta, the University of Montreal, and the University of Toronto. And then as time passed, they found the hook. That hook caught the whole world by surprise. The rest of the world's been chasing the Canadian research for that period of time. We then <clears throat> noticed that the world did the first thing that they could think of, which was try to steal everyone from Canada and pull them to their own locations. We said, hey, that's not so great an idea. And uh, it invested in programs and facilities, the AI institutes and the Pan-Canadian AI strategy to make it uh, more effective for those researchers to stay here and do their work here. So, Stefan, Canada launched the Pan-Canadian AI strategy in 2017. Now, it was the first national strategy. Over the past four years, how specifically has that helped Canada become even more of a leader in AI? It's provided great leverage to uh, develop the AI ecosystem. Uh, by funding Mila, Vector and Amy, and the chairs that were provided to those institutions, we retained and attracted the best AI talent, and that in turn attracted the best PhDs out there, uh, allowing us to maintain our leadership in, in developing AI, a and also creating a pool of talent that uh, 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 allowed specialized workers to uh, join industry after that. Canada then, with that huge pool of talent in all of the three cities, was able to attract big tech players to the, to the scenery. We saw the likes of uh, Google, Facebook, Samsung, and Microsoft uh, sign up and establish laboratories in Montreal between 2016 and 2018. So Cam, what new future goals have been set based on the initial work from the strategy? I think the thing that Stefan mentioned and we keep coming back to is this talent piece and making sure that we continue to produce the top talent in the world and just how important that is. What we've really seen now is making sure that that talent has the opportunity to have impact here in Canada, whether that's by joining a world leading lab, because that's a great opportunity for them to do that, whether it's joining an existing company in Canada to be able to lead out their AI efforts, or whether it's to create a new startup or join a new startup to be able to have impact and create something completely new and completely new solution. It's really about continuing to create the top talent in the world and then leverage that by creating a, a large amount of opportunities for that talent to just have a huge impact on the world. Okay, Garth, what does Canada need to do to maintain its top position? Well, it has to convince the world's best that they wanna be here in Canada. And that's actually easier than you might think. It's a wonderful place to live, has a fabulous immigration policy, 
It has a, a high population of well-trained people. It has a high degree of respect for academics. It has social programs that, that support individuals and support companies. It has uh, a lot to offer. What we're doing more locally is saying, let's, let's attract those people to our ecosystems. If a city like Montreal, Toronto, or Edmonton has a half a dozen or a dozen companies that they think, wow, I could get a whole career with those organizations, then it becomes easy. Uh, if they have a university of extreme stature, it becomes easy. If there is a, a startup culture in which they can uh, interact and start companies and hear what's going on, it becomes easy. So, so those are the types of techniques. The institutes wrap around them. We provide resources, collaboration resources. We provide staff support for the immigration that they're going to face. We provide support for their partnerships, their alumni, their career. And fundamentally, most of what we're doing is training a workforce that leaves our institute. All the students, all the postdocs, even our own staff, are being upskilled and ejected into the Canadian ecosystem. Now, Cam, Canada has an impressive talent pool. That's not disputed. But with concerns about a brain drain, how can it keep top talent? What's needed to ensure retention? If you look at the history of Canada, when people have left, um, you know, whether the university or whether people have graduated and gone to other locales, it's not because they didn't want to live there. It's because the opportunity that they wanted was somewhere else. So making sure that we create those opportunities here. The second one is we need to pay people what they're worth. People are getting offered very large salaries elsewhere. And sometimes in Canada, we get thought of or we project ourselves as the cheap option. And if you look at the talent coming out of our schools, we're the best option. And I will say the great part that we've seen over the last number of years with the Pan-Canadian AI program has been that we've actually um, both retained far more and started to attract back and attract people to Canada for these ecosystems that are here. So where do we stand today? Stefan, what gaps still exist between research and commercial practice in Canada? So health is a sector of immense potential for AI in Canada, especially because being a one payer uh, system, in theory, we should have access to tons of data. We need government to make easier for industry, not only in health, but in other sectors, to, to familiarize themselves with their own data. And then with the methodologies of AI, which are still pretty much obscure to a lot of the SMEs community in Canada. And the Canadian econ economy is, uh, is mostly made up of SMEs, as we know. A lot of opportunity and developments to look out for in the health sector. Stefan, Garth, Cam, thank you very much. Luring AI talent to Canada became a lot easier during Donald Trump's days in office. His administration's higher American policies meant far fewer high-skilled tech visas were issued, while Ottawa's Fast Track program became a boon for Canada's AI ecosystem. Between 2013 and 2018, Toronto saw growth in tech jobs jump 54% while growth in Vancouver jumped 43%, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics and CBRE. But the pandemic has put a major dent in Ottawa's high-skilled work permits, creating problems for Canada's AI scene. The number of people coming to Canada under the Global Skills Strategy Program was down 49% between January and August of 2020, with approvals taking months rather than as little as two weeks. To discuss how Canada can maintain its top spot in artificial intelligence and machine learning, I'm joined by Sean Malhotra, Head of Engineering at Thomson Reuters. Sean, the company recently announced plans to rely more on machines in a post-pandemic world. What's the reasoning behind this strategic move? So Thomson Reuters is fundamentally a business information services company. And our customers, whether they be lawyers, uh, accountants and other tax professionals, uh, compliance officers, and of course, our journalists through our, our Reuters news organization, they're all immersed in mounds and mounds of data. Right? These are data-rich industries with complex problems to solve. That's sort of the sweet spot for AI. Right? When you take these modern techniques and apply them to those really, really rich data sets, you can surface insights that, for instance, help a lawyer find the exact case they need at exactly the right time. So that explosion of information plus the emergence of the algorithms has really helped us solve these complex problems for our customers more effectively. 
Well, a quick search shows Thomson Reuters is on a big hiring spree in this space. So what kinds of jobs do you need to fill? Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're, we're hiring en masse. You know, if I look at our Toronto presence, um, we've grown from just under 20 people in 2016 um, to over 400 today. Um, we've got about 100 job openings right now. Um, many of those are full stack software engineers, so people doing back end processing, front end design. Of course, got several openings for data scientists and researchers, um, some of which would join our, our labs organization that helps us innovate and stay at the forefront of AI. We're looking for architects, we're looking for development managers. So, because we're doing this at scale, we have all sorts of great technology needs to serve our customers. What does Canada need to do to upskill and train new workers? It starts with the education systems. Right, ensuring that we are arming you know, people right from, right from the beginning of education um, with the right skills to succeed uh, in the modern workforce. Um, crucially, providing programs and incentives to allow people to continually retrain themselves. I think one of the things we have to own in technology is that we've, we've not had the right representation of, of, all, uh, of all parts of society. You know, gender is a big one where we don't have equal representation across the technology industry. So the more we can encourage all parts of society to get involved in these, uh, in these great, exciting fields, the more we can unlock the full potential of our workforce. So I think there's a lot of things we can do. Okay, the big question, how can Canada maintain its pole position as an AI leader? What does it need to do to keep its upper hand? How do we make this the place that talent wants to be to, to deploy their skills? Right? That's, that's where the investment, that's where the innovation is going to come from. And so when you think about that, it's continue having world-class uh, education systems. Um, it's provide those training opportunities. Um, and I think a big part of this also comes to organizations like Thomson Reuters, make this a place people want to work. Give them exciting work. You know, if you, give, if you, if you pair subject matter expertise, rich data sets and great technologists, awesome things happen. And so it's also incumbent on us to create those great opportunities. Well, education and opportunity sounds key. Sean, thank you very much. Well, that's it for our show. Be sure to join the AI Conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Tune in to our next episode when we'll discuss why it is so difficult for Canadian AI startups to scale. For more on the latest in business, technology, and innovation from around the world, log on to globalivemedia.com. Thanks for watching.